The year is 1877. The penultimate war between the Russian and the Ottoman empires was about to begin. 20 years earlier, the Russians had suffered a humiliating defeat at the hands of the United Forces of Britain, France, Turkey, and the Kingdom of Sardinia. Formally, Russia entered the Crimean War in order to gain control over the Holy Land. The real reason was altogether different. Russia was at the head of an orthodox coalition together with recently liberated Ottoman lands, Romania and Montenegro. Many Bulgarians joined in, whose state had been non-existent for half a millennium. The justification for the war bore distinctly moral overtones. Russia was out to defend the human rights of Christians in the Ottoman Empire. The moment was propitiously chosen. Muslim irregulars had perpetuated mass atrocities in southern Bulgaria, to which the Ottoman authorities had turned a blind eye. Public opinion in Europe came out strongly in favor of the Bulgarians. In 1877, Russia strove to regain the great power prestige it had lost during the Crimean War. Despite widespread misgivings that his army was not equipped to conduct modern war, the emperor was in a hurry to take advantage of the opportunity afforded by the humanitarian crisis. That is why the Russians plotted a blitzkrieg off the beaten path. Their territorial ambitions involved parts of the Caucasus as well as the Danube River Delta. Moral outrage silenced European voices in support of the Sultan. In contrast to the Crimean War, Europe was to play a marginal role. The Ottomans hoped to maintain the territorial integrity of their empire, riven as it was by rebellion and bankruptcy. A war was getting underway that was to change the fortunes of Europe. Why did the city of Pleven become the most important theater in the battle for new Europe? The main Russian force was to ford the Danube, Europe's longest river, cradle of its civilization. Russia moved a 200,000 strong army on the river's northern shore and another 100,000 in the Caucasus. War was formally declared. The Russians subjected the Turkish naval vessels to massive bombardment, destroying some and blocking the rest in the delta. Thus, they opened up a direct line for disembarking on the southern side. The exact location remained a mystery. It was the end of June. After a fake move, the main Russian battle group disembarked near the town of Svistov. They met with little resistance. Three weeks later, the important fortress of Nikopol fell as well. Unexpected to both sides, one city became the flashpoint of the entire war. Plevin. The Russian HQ had ordered the 5th Infantry Division to take it. 
the city was already fortified under the command of Osman Pasha. He had rushed to relieve Nikobol, but realizing it was too late to get there on time, decided to mount a determined defense of Pleven. Despite their initial success, the Russians overplayed their hand. Their speedy advance south of the Danube meant they were in danger of being caught in a pincher by Osman Pasha's forces in the west and those of Mehmet Ali Pasha from the east. Later analyses would reveal that intelligence on both sides had performed poorly. The Ottoman High Command in Istanbul expected the invading force to come via the Black Sea and northern Dobruja. Hence, the strongest Turkish army was deployed in a fortified quadrant demarcated by the cities of Varna, Silistra, Ruse, and Schumann. Only after the fall of the Danubian ports of Svistov and Nikopol, it dawned on the Ottomans that Pleven would be the next target. The city had always been of strategic importance as it lay between the Great River and the Balkan foothills. The Balkan mountains are the only natural barrier of note between the Danube and the Ottoman capital. Pleven was tasked with closing the corridor the Russians had opened between river and mountain. In the months that followed, the map of modern Europe was to be drawn there. But who were the master map makers? The defender of Pleven, Osman Pasha, was a graduate of the military academy in Istanbul. He took part in the Crimean War and put down many a mutiny. Opposite him was an old adversary from 1856 who would soon seek revenge for Russia. The Baltic German in Russian service, General Edward Totelbin. Between them rose a legendary figure, General Mikhail Skobolev, the conqueror of Central Asia. Pleven had been a part of the Ottoman Empire for five centuries, but had not lost its Bulgarian character. A significant section of its population spoke Bulgarian, went to church, followed their traditions. Immediately prior to the fateful battle, the city still led the kind of life atypical of an Asiatic province. It boasted a hospital, a Swiss-inspired zoo, many inns. Much construction was going on. The clouds were gathering, though. The Russian army arrived on the 19th of July. After their relatively easy victories in Svistov and Nikopol, they expected smooth sailing. Fate had decided otherwise. Tens of thousands were to fall. Osman Pasha had only just made it into the city and was busy fortifying it. The Russians were late. Having become aware of the presence of an adversary, the Russians subjected Pleven to an artillery bombardment, but did not attempt an assault. This tactic bore no fruit, as the Ottomans had built a system of outlying redoubts, and the city was outside the reach of the Russian guns whose operators fell easy prey to Turkish sharpshooters.
the Russian command decided to attack the redoubts the following day. The Russians were armed with modified U.S. rifles Berdana 1 and 2, as well as the Czech-made Grunka. The Berdana was as good as the best available at the time. The Peabody Martini Henry Martini magazine loader, that was the weapon of choice of the Ottoman army. The Bulgarian volunteers were using the French breech loader, Shaspol. Contemporary arms designers in Europe and the US were experimenting with brand new systems whose efficiency far outweighed that of the previous generation of front loaders. All the prominent gun makers sold their latest to whoever came calling but the Russians had one unquestionable advantage. Their military engineers. It was they who had enabled the speedy crossing of the Danube at Svistov using pontoons. On the 20th of July, the Russians attempted a classic attack. Around 4,000 infantrymen and cavalry attempted to breach the Ottoman defenses. Osman Pasha moved in reinforcements, and the Russian attack was mired. By the end of the day, their losses amounted to 3,000 dead and wounded. The Turks lost around 2,000. The Russians pulled out. In the days following the assault, the commanders requested reinforcements and got what they wanted. The invading force was now 35,000 strong, with 184 guns, while the Turks had a force of 20,000, with only 57 guns. The disparity was not as great as it seems as defending requires less resources than attacking. Russian HQ ordered a new attack. The winner of the Nikopol operation, General Kredener, ordered an advance on the 30th of July. He hesitated. Intelligence sources had overestimated the number of defenders within the fortress by a factor of three. The Russians fell on the Turkish defensive lines near the village of Grivica. It was even bloodier this time. By the end of the day, they lost around 7,000 soldiers and 200 officers. The Turkish losses were much lower, only around 3,800 dead and wounded. Osman Pasha, however, faced a hard choice, to try to break out of the besieged city or to remain inside and defend it. In August, he decided on the first option. At the same time, the Eastern Army was on its way to relieve him from their bases in Rusay and Rosgrad. While an expeditionary force led out of Albania by Suleiman Pasha attacked the Russian positions at the Shipka Pass from the south. The Imperial Danubian Army was being squeezed from three sides in the narrow corridor between the river and the mountain. Despite the odds, 
the Russians pushed back Osman into Pleven and repelled the Ottomans at Rusay and Shipka. A month passed as the siege carried on into high summer. The local population began lacking in basic foodstuffs. The army was still well supplied. In the meantime, the Turks suffered a defeat. On the 31st of August, they attempted a sortie along the line between the villages of Pelishant and Skalavoy. Few survived, and they were forced to retreat to the fortress. After a series of tactical mistakes and extraordinary heroism on both sides, the Ottoman army lost control of the Shipka Pass. the shortest route between northern and southern Bulgaria. Days before the third assault, Russians and Turks battled it out for the city of Lovech, a 30-kilometer distance from Pleven. Osman Pasha had stationed part of his contingent there with the intention of harassing the Russian rear. He did attempt to relieve the embattled Lovich regiment, but was quickly made to return to Pleven. Later, Osman Pasha was criticized by his peers for having scattered his forces instead of concentrating them. The white general returned to Pleven from Lovech in order to head a sortie into the Turkish rear. All summer long, the Turks had been constructing a system of redoubts. Complex polygonal fortifications built on earthen foundations and manned by a few hundred soldiers each. The defenders could easily pick off attackers as they approached the redoubt from below. The Russians were facing a nightmare and were as yet unaware of it. With a numerical advantage of three to one, they thought they had the upper hand. Emperor Alexander himself arrived in Pleven to witness the victory the southernmost destination he was ever going to physically be present in. He was accompanied by his brother, the Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich, and the Romanian Prince Carol I. The Romanian parliament had just proclaimed independence of the Ottoman Empire. A victory over the ancient overlord would enable Carol to proclaim himself king. The Russian high command told the emperor the decisive onslaught was to take place on the 11th of September, the day of his patron saint. The victory would be dedicated to Alexander. The battlefront stretched for miles, from the village of Radishevo to Grivica. Two days after the start, the results were chilling. 12,500 Russian soldiers, 300 officers, and two generals had lost their lives. Romanian losses numbered 3,000.
The Turks lost 3,000 too, an insignificant casualty rate in comparison given the scale of the battle. The Russian command was demoralized. At this precise moment, Osman Pasha understood he had an opening for a lightning counterattack. He chose the Grivita readout. He failed to take it, but inflicted heavy losses on the Romanians, over a thousand dead. Every engagement now meant thousands lost their lives. Weaponry had become a decisive factor since the Crimean War and the American Civil War. Technological advance meant automation, which brought a huge advantage. The Ottoman army had access to the latest and best armaments on offer. Corruption was widespread and endemic and anyone involved in the arms trade lobbied to secure a deal with the high port and the highest possible commission for themselves. Corruption was the main reason the empire was soon to founder. Russians were not above lining their pockets either, but in time-honored tradition, military matters were afforded special status. So victory had to be postponed and a new solution found. The Grand Duke thought he had found the right person to provide it, Edward Totleben. The Romanian Prince Carol assumed overall command and the unassuming Baltic German became chief of staff. Totleben had been in the shoes of Osman Pasha. As a young officer during the Crimean War, he had led the defense of Sebastopol against the British and the French. He had inflicted heavy losses on them through engineering ingenuity. Now the tables were turned. Totleben had to destroy the infrastructure from the outside. As soon as he arrived in September, he decreed there would be no fourth assault. Instead, he ordered that facing every Turkish redoubt, there had to be a Russian one. Next, he cut off all supply routes into the city and asked for reinforcements. The newly arrived Elite Guards and Grenadier regiments with their modern Berjana rifles, he directed towards the villages of Dolny Dubnik and Telish, as well as the town of Vratza. With those strategic locations now firmly in Russian hands, Plevin fell into total isolation. Osman Pasha could not rely on any supplies of food and munitions or even contact with HQ. A little earlier, he had asked for permission to retreat in the direction of Sofia. The Sultan himself turned him down. Plevin still had some reserves of wheat. A string of small water mills running on the local streams turned it into flour. Totleben ordered the construction of a dam, collecting the headwaters and then released them all at once, thereby destroying all the water mills. His methods were reminiscent of the Great War rather than of a conventional 19th century siege. Now, the city folk were truly facing starvation. What little supplies there were went to the army. The soldiers went hunting for sparrows with slings. The zoo was ravaged, the animals killed for food. The bellows of the starving livestock ennerved everyone, but no one was allowed to slaughter it in case supplies were needed for a counterattack. Any civilian who dared set aside something for themselves was publicly executed. The Russians offered the garrison to surrender, but Osman declined, hoping the Eastern Army would arrive and attack the besieging force in the back. But Plevin was alone. His army was dying of sickness and hunger. The cold was becoming unbearable. On the 30th of November, he gathered his commanders. The council pondered the options. 
either languish in hopelessness or attack in the knowledge that an attempt at a breakthrough would mean massive casualties, possibly the loss of the entire army. They decided to attack. During the night of the 9th of December, Osman Pasha divided his force into five, 42,000 troops. Around midnight, in total silence and under cover of dense fog over the river Vit, the troops began their desperate bid for freedom, to no avail. A patrol noticed the movement and gave the alarm. At seven in the morning, the Russians opened with a random volley. The Turks replied in kind and the battle began. Osman's army headed towards the village of Dolna Metropolia when they came head to head with a Russian regiment. The Russians waited until they were a couple of hundred meters away and started mowing them down, volley after volley. The chaos was indescribable. Almost all the Russians were butchered and their front line broken. At 8.30 a.m., a new regiment was sent to reinforce the line but it too was crushed. The second line of defense fell. Then the commander of the Grenadier Corps, General Ivan Ganetsky, ordered an all out attack. Osman's troops were caught in a vice. Finally, Skobolev's two brigades appeared at their back and rushed into battle. The Ottomans panicked. Some fell on themselves and headed towards the bridge, leading back to the city, but were pushed into the river. In the early afternoon, a shell killed Osman's horse and wounded him in the leg. With this came the end. A white flag flew over the impenetrable redoubts near the village of Obanets. Osman delivered his sword to General Ganetsky. Later, he was brought before the emperor, who ordered that he be given back his sword in a gesture of respect and recognition of his indomitable spirit in defending Plevin. After short captivity, Osman would return to Istanbul and resume his career, eventually becoming Minister of War. And what of the white general, Osman Pasha's rival for martial glory? He wanted to take the Ottoman capital himself, at the head of his own troops. His ambition remained unfulfilled, but he went on fighting other wars until the end of his own life, prematurely cut short at 39. The battle for Plevin was instrumental in the creation of modern Europe. It opened the way to a Russian advance on Istanbul. The Great Power concert would not allow it, but after much diplomatic wrangling, the map of Europe assumed more or less its present form. Levin became a Bulgarian city again, this time as part of the Third Kingdom, itself the legitimate heir to the Second Empire. Its implacable enemy was the Russia of Emperor Alexander III, the Liberator's own son. Such are the ever-twisting spirals of history. The world has seen many wars and will no doubt see many more. But there are battles that mean a lot more than winning a war. As if by divine ordination, they decide the fate of entire nations, sometimes of whole continents. 
After such battles, nations and continents can never be the same again.